done. It's the 245th birthday of this nation. 1776, 2021, 245 years. So we're gonna have a time of prayer for our country during our worship. And there's some special sh songs by our worship team that uh, will pertain to this special occasion. Now our Bible reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter four and verses 25 through 32. Now here Paul is speaking to the Ephesian Christians, okay? And he was telling them that as members of Christ's body, believers are called to show integrity, kindness, and grace, and they must overcome bitterness and anger and learn to forgive. So see if you can pick up these points as we go through this reading, if you follow along with me, beginning in verse 25. Therefore, having put away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed. For the day of redemption, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Let us pray. Father God, it's in Jesus' dear name that we approach your throne of grace, Father. On this special day, we want to thank you so much, Father, for the freedom that we have living here in this country. We want to thank you for the servicemen, past and present, Lord, who have guaranteed that freedom. But ultimately, we know that you're in full control of all things, Father. So we thank you. Lord, it's imperative that we follow your word of truth that we glorify you, Father, in the things that we do. Lord, it's not us that you speak through us as we apply your word. Father, we want to encourage those who are connected with us online. Some are at a long distance and they can't be here. But those who can, Father, not, this is not belittling. We want to encourage them. As the author of Hebrews encouraged, in chapter 10 and verse 24 and, five, and 25, he said, let us consider or ponder, let us consider one another to love and find works, not forsaking the gathering of ourselves as some have the custom, but encouraging one another all the more as we see the day drawing near. Father, it's important that we strengthen one another, that we hear, that we hear to not only to help, but to love, to grieve, to cry, to smile, and be happy. Lord, we're here to bear the burdens of our brothers. And the only way that we can uplift and upbuild one another is if we're here in person. So we, we pray, Father, that that happens. We pray that you, your spirit continue to encourage not only this church, but, but our pastor who leads us. We certainly pray that your spirit be with Pastor Kyle, that he speaks mightily your word. Uh, and also that uh, we, we know, Father, that he's speaking by means of you. We pray that not only you bless him, but his family. And Lord, on this great day, we want to beg for forgiveness. We want to beg for forgiveness, Father, of the times we fall short, which are many. And we don't want to misuse your grace as an excuse for wrongdoing, Father. But help us always do the things that are right. So we thank you. Pray your blessing on this day. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please, please stand as we begin to sing. Good morning. Good morning. Ooh, I heard everybody this morning. Excellent. Happy Fourth of July. Let's praise the Lord with sound and sung prayer. tree 
sorrows are we really we need to really look at that trade your sorrows trade your pain trade it all for the love of the Lord hallelujah
How many reasons are there to be blessed by the Lord? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up. Sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, O oh my soul Oh my soul 
draws near and my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then Shall we pray? Dear God, thank you for your great power. We praise you for your truth. We're grateful that you have set us free from the clutching grasp of sin and death. Would you be with your people, extending your grace, granting your freedom, providing your protection, and empowering with your strength? We ask that you'd bring about the awakening of your presence as never seen before, we ask that your name be proclaimed, that all plans to silence the name of Jesus would be thwarted and crushed. We pray that many would come to know you as Lord and Savior. We pray that many would see your light, that you would open blind eyes and release those still in prison. You, we pray that you would unify your people for the glory of your name, that all who call themselves Christians would rise up believing your great truth. Wake us up, Lord. Remind us to live aware, to redeem the time, to listen to your words, to be willing to make a difference in this land. We pray for all those in authority that you would give them your wisdom and discernment as they lead. We ask that you would appoint strong, faithful men and women to serve this nation and our people. We pray that your great healing on our land shine your face on us, dear God. We need you now more than ever before our times are in your hands. Thank you that you are rich in mercy and full of grace. Thank you that you are forgiving and merciful. Thank you that you are strong and mighty. Thank you that you are for us and that you fight for us still today. Bring honor to your name, O Lord, for you alone are worthy. In the powerful name of Jesus we pray, amen. Hallelujah. So. <clears throat> We just learned this song this week. Um, it's a new song that we've, uh, we just, I just heard it this week. Um, so the words will be up there, but you're not expected to sing unless you know the song. You can jump right in whenever you want.
Hallelujah. Let your glory fly, Lord. Bring it down. Bless us in his name. On? There we go. Thank you guys very, very much. Great job this morning. Uh, so boys and girls, if you guys normally head out to Children's Church, we'll go ahead and release you guys. You guys can head up there. Uh, Miss Brittany's in the back. She'll, uh, she'll get you where you need to go. So exit my stage left right back there. All right, if you're staying in uh, as they kind of make their way down, right, the... Uh, as, as we mentioned before, right, we don't pass offering plates, at least not now. Maybe we'll start that up again somewhere in the future. But if you'd like to give to Gallup Hill Baptist Church to support the ministries uh, that go on here, uh, there's a drop box on the, on the way out that you can drop a check or, or cash in. Uh, you can go online to your church app uh, and give online there, whatever is, is most convenient to you. I'll make my way up here now that they're off. So a couple of things by, by way of announcements that I'd like to talk about here before we jump into the message. And uh, if you're prepping, you're going to open up your Bibles to 2 Samuel. Uh, so you, you can go ahead and start doing that if you want to. 2 Samuel will be, we'll be bouncing around in there a little bit, uh, but somewhere around chapters 15. You plant yourself there, you should be good. Uh, but coming up next Sunday, next Sunday, July 11th, we have a baptism service. Uh, first one since the pandemic began. That's not to say we haven't baptized people during the pandemic. We have. They've just been more private ceremonies, right, that we gathered two or three upstairs and did it. But this coming Sunday, we're going to baptize five, three youths uh, and two adults. So the service will be, if you've never attended a baptism service, the first half of the service will look pretty normal. Uh, after that, I'll come up and, and really just talk for about five minutes on baptism and what it is and why we should be baptized. Uh, and then we'll hear the testimonies of those five people. Uh, like I said, two, two adults, three youths. They'll come up, uh, they'll, they'll read or speak their testimonies, or somebody will read or speak it for them, or there's actually going to be one that's going to be recorded uh, and, and will be played. After that, uh, we will all go up to the chapel, so that upstairs building over there where we normally have children's church, right, where the actual baptisms will happen. Right? So we'll all kind of crowd in there for a, a couple of minutes uh, while we go through and do it. So you'll want to be here next week. Uh, the, the first, you know, the, the, the service in here, for those that are, that are out online, you guys will get to see really everything but the actual baptism. So uh, a reason to, to be here in person uh, next Sunday. Now, that said, so next Sunday there'll be no children's church, right, because we're going to need that room up there. Uh, that's one of the reasons. The second reason is, is three of their friends are being baptized. So we want them in here to hear their friends' testimonies, Right. Uh, that, that is a good thing. So no children's church next weekend. And right now, we, we currently don't have a nursery next weekend. So where we are in nursery, we have three, uh, three nursery teams that can fill in through the course of the month, right? So we have one Sunday uh, that's uncovered right now. So if that's something that you kind of feel called to, right? Like, I don't know where I can plug in. I, I love kids, right? That's a place. We need another two people uh, to plug in so that we get each Sunday of the month covered uh, on our nursery. All right, so that's a place you can serve. If you were uh, listening a couple of months ago, we started talking about the Ledger Food Pantry. We've been asked as a church to take a more active involvement uh, in that. There have been some hiccups as they move to a, a new facility, but they're still looking for volunteers. I emailed a number of you uh, this week that had expressed interest in that. But if that's something you'd like to do, they're looking for somebody uh, for a couple hours on Tuesday, a couple hours on Thursday, or maybe on Saturday as well, uh, shoot me an email. Right, and we can get you set up. There's an online training you do at home, uh, and then you go in and, uh, and do kind of an on-site training after that. All right. Uh, ooh, let's see. We got two more things to talk about here. Tubing trip, right? Just to, how, what are we doing this summer? We're getting everybody together to have fun. Two Saturdays from yesterday, so July 17th. Saturday, July 17th. We're going to the Farmington River. Uh, the cost is, is 25 per person. You got to bring cash, right? They don't take uh, credit cards or charge cards there. Minimum age, you really need to be about fourth or fifth grade and above. There's a height kind of minimum and a weight kind of minimum. But we're going to meet at the tubing place at 1230. We're going to start at 1. It'll take a couple hours to kind of tube down the river. There's a little, you know, whitewater rapids in there. They're nothing big. We'll keep an eye on the weather. But if you go into your church app, I didn't bring my phone up here. Go into the church app and hit connect 
the connect with us tab is where you'll, you'll see Tubing River sign up down there. We need to know like who's planning on going, right? You're not going to pay us, right? You're just going to bring it and, and do that yourself. But so that we know we're bringing a group of 15 or we're bringing a group of 25. We can call them ahead of time and let them know. All right. So fun to be had on July 17th. Uh, and last but certainly not least, you'll notice on the side tables, uh, we are no longer doing the New City Catechism this summer. We'll start it again on the fall. But on the side tables, you'll find one of these. They were in the Monday email. They'll be going out again. They're also in the Connect With Us tab. We are reading through the Gospels uh, and the Book of Acts together as a church. It started on Thursday. Uh, we'll continue for the months of July and August. Uh, why should you do this? Right? The Word of God, listen, a, a reason when you read the word of God, it awakens, guys, and strengthens your faith, okay? When you go into the scriptures, you put yourself in the Spirit's path to come and speak to you, to reveal Christ to you and strengthen your faith. So if, if you haven't started and you're like, ah, grab one, you're only two days behind, right? We don't schedule it on the weekends. It's Monday through Friday, so you've got the weekends to catch up. In case you miss a day, grab one and participate with us. They're going to lead us right into the second half of the New City Catechism, which will start in September, okay? All right, that's all the announcements for today. Let me ask you guys a question as, as we kind of start this thing today. How many of you guys have ever heard of Jesus, right? Hands? I would expect it. If, I, if everybody's hands didn't go up, I should fire myself, right? Uh, <laughs> How about David? Right, David, yes, okay, hands are up, yep. Ruth, Ruth, yes, okay. Titus, yeah, hands. How about Ahithophel? Hands up, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Kind of sounds like, he's, I'm gonna stumble over that name at some point in this message. He's a minor character uh, in the Old Testament. You really have to kind of piece his story together from, from several different books and from several different passages, but his life has a very, very powerful message in it and is going to speak to a very real issue that you might be experiencing that I almost guarantee you're experiencing or have experienced or will experience. We're going to approach this a little differently, right? We've spent January through the end of June preaching through a catechism, which has been very, kind of, here's the question, here's the answer. You know, we, we, we kind of speak, it's, it's a very direct kind of way of doing things. This, we're going to kind of back into it today. So we're going to ask the question, you know, like, who is this guy? When I ask the question, who's heard of him? About half a dozen of you raised your hands, right? Who is this guy? And what went on in his life that can teach us how to react to what's going on around us. I think his story is going to speak very powerfully. So like I mentioned, we're mostly going to be in 2 Samuel 15 through 17. We're going to be jumping around. Passages will be up there on the board. But let's ask the question, who is this guy? Who's Ahithophel? If you go to uh, the book of 1 Chronicles, you don't have to turn there. It's going to be up on the screen, right? You know King David. I mentioned him earlier, a little bit earlier, like David and Goliath, right? Greatest king of Israel, major Old Testament character. So listen to what it says uh, about Ahithophel in 1 Chronicles 27, 32 through 33. It says, Jonathan, David's uncle, was a counselor, okay? Being a man of understanding and a scribe. He and Yehiel, the son of Hachmanai, attended the king's sons. Ahithophel was the king's counselor. And Hushai, the archite, was the king's friend. So who is this guy? He's one of King David's counselors. Now, David had many advisors, right? Some were good. Some were just kind of eh. Some were not so good. But Ahithophel was the best. Okay? 2 Samuel 16, 23. If you're in the book of 2 Samuel, look at, at chapter 16, verse 23. What does it say about Ahithophel? It says, now in those days, the counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. 
so was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed, both by David and by Absalom. Absalom was David's son. We'll get to him. He'll kind of factor into the story in just a minute. Okay, let's be honest. That's a good counselor, right? It's as if somebody consulted the word of God. It's as if the Lord were speaking, man, you want somebody like that in your corner. He was intelligent. He was wise. He was discerning. He was understanding. He had insight. He understood people. He understood situations. He understood politics. He understood tactics, right? He would advise David on what was prudent and what was wise. He was an esteemed and valued counselor. And he served David for years, right? The, the first half of the book of 2 Samuel is really about David coming to the throne and expanding the Jewish kingdom. And by his side, through the whole thing, was Ahithophel. Think of him like, you know, modern day secretary of state, maybe, or secretary of defense, or national security advisor, or somebody like that, okay? All right, so that's, that's Ahithophel. Now, David, right? David was a lot of things. Uh, David was a man after God's own heart. David trusted in the Lord. He was just and merciful and kind. He was a mighty warrior. He was an expert tactician, but sometimes, honestly, he struggled at being a good dad. Wasn't always the best parent. He had multiple wives, which this probably contributed to it, right? Lots of wives, lots of kids. Hard to be a really good parent when you really can't keep up with your dozens and dozens of kids, right? So maybe we cut him a little bit of slack there. But one of his sons, a guy named Amnon, uh, over the course of David's life, sexually assaulted his half-sister, Tamar, okay? Both of these are David's children, just by a different mother, right? So they're half-brother, half-sister, so you're like, uh, this is a little weird, right? But Amnon became infatuated with her. He lured her in, right, pretending to be sick. She came in to tend to him, and he assaulted her. And David really did nothing as a result of that. So Tamar went to live with her half-brother Absalom. Told you he would factor into the story, right? Absalom, as her full brother, is not really happy about this, but he bides his time. And a couple of years later, he lures Amnon into a trap and murders him. And then flees into exile. Okay, so Absalom goes off. This is the whole, right, this is chapters and chapters in the book of 2 Samuel. I'm summarizing a lot. You fast forward those seven years, and Absalom is back in Jerusalem, and he and David are somewhat reconciled, but not really. And Absalom ultimately leads a rebellion against David, and he, it, it actually succeeds, kind of crazily enough. He flushes David out of Jerusalem with his advisors. David is fleeing out into the wilderness. Absalom has him on the run, and right before he enters Jerusalem, right before Absalom comes in to David's seat of power, what does he do? Look at 2 Samuel 15, verse 12. 2 Samuel 15, 12. And while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, so right as he sacrificed the Lord, right before he comes in, he sent for who? Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor from his city at Gilo. And the conspiracy grew strong, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. So Ahithophel betrays David and throws his counsel and his wisdom behind Absalom's insurrection. And so as David is fleeing Jerusalem, he hears, right, somebody comes and says, hey, David, right, Absalom is with, or excuse me, Ahithophel is with Absalom. And David pauses and goes, oh, this is not good. So he tells his friend Hushai, he says, you got to go back. You got to go back and somehow work your way into Absalom's good graces, and you got to counter this guy, or we're in trouble. And so Hushai does, and he goes back, uh, and he pretends to be with, with Absalom, and he convinces him that, that he's loyal to the throne and not necessarily to the guy on it. Absalom buys it. And so who is Ahithophel? He's a traitor. Now, once David's out of Jerusalem, Absalom knows, right, David is an immensely popular ruler. 
military, the country's militarily safe, right? Poverty has been eliminated, right? David is hugely popular, so he knows he's got to do something to convince the people that he's serious about this or the population's just going to side with David. So what does he do? Well, what does Ahithophel tell him to do? 2 Samuel 16, 20 through 22. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, give me your counsel. What do we do? Right? What do we do to convince people that we're serious about this? And Ahithophel said to Absalom, go into your father's concubines. These are kind of like second-class wives, really. Uh, some ways kind of play things. Go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house, and all Israel will hear that you've made yourself a stench to your father, and the hands of all who are with you will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof. Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel. On the roof of the palace. Go into your father's concubines. Do it on the roof so everybody can see it. And they'll know you're serious. So he does that. Once it's happened, what goes on after that? Look down to verse, or chapter 17. Moreover, right, as soon as this is done, Ahithophel says to Absalom, let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. We're still on day one of this thing, right? I will come upon him while he's weary and discouraged and throw him into a panic, and all the people who are with him will flee, and I'll strike down only the king, and I'll bring all the people back to you as a bride comes home to her husband. You seek the life of only one man, and all the people will be at peace. And the advice seemed right in the eyes of Absalom, the elders of Israel. What does he say? He says, Absalom, give me 12,000 men, and I'll chase David. I'll find him. We'll, we'll go out. And I, they're disorganized. They're discombobulated. He's, he, he's trying to get himself right. They're fleeing out in the wilderness. Let me chase him. I'll come upon him. I'll throw him into a panic. Everybody will be in, and I'll strike down the king. Oh, he is mad. He is angry. He wants to humiliate David. That's the thing with the wives, right? He wants to take everything. I'm going to take the throne. I'm going to take Jerusalem. I'm going to take your family. I'm going to drive all your friends away so that you are alone, and I'm going to kill you in the dark. What happened? What happened to take this amazing counselor and turn him against David? What happened to take a man that had been loyal for years and do this? Well, if you're familiar with the life of David, you'll know his greatest mistake is, is not being, not that he wasn't always a great dad, but his sin with Bathsheba. If you go back to chapter 11, flip back to chapter 11. Keep your finger in 15 and 16. Go back to chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. Now, in the spring of the year... The time when the kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servant with him and all of Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, and, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. He saw on the roof, from the roof, a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent a messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. Now she'd been purifying herself for an uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I'm pregnant. Now David's got a problem. She shouldn't be pregnant, right? Her husband is off at war. So David knows. He's like, oh, boy, they're going to trace this back to me. i got to do something about this. So what does he do? I'm going to summarize the rest of the chapter. He summons Uriah home from battle, gets him home, and he says, you know, come here, hang out, right? And tonight, go see your wife. De-stress a little bit, right? Well, Uriah is a man of honor. It's like all my brothers are off at war. My commanders are there. Why should I enjoy the benefits of being at home? So he doesn't do it. He sleeps outside David's door that night. So David wakes up in the morning, he's like, oh, okay. So he's like, all right, hang out another day. 
and we'll see what happens. So he gets him drunk that night, thinking, I get him drunk, but he still doesn't go home. So what does David do? David says, all right, I'm going to send you back to the battle. So he writes a letter to the commander, and he says, what I want you to do is I want you to put Uriah up front. And I want you to put him where the fighting is the hottest, and then when the battle is the fiercest, I want you to draw back, and I want you to make sure he gets killed. So the commander does that, and Uriah is murdered. God's not all that happy about that, so he sends Nathan the prophet to confront David. David admits his sin, is confessed and forgiven, right? But the child that, that is born to Bathsheba, God says the child's not going to make it. And you say, okay, all this is great. What does this have to do with Ahithophel? Well, listen, it's all in the relationships. Look at 1 Samuel 11.3. We just read this, right? David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba, okay, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, okay? That's who this woman is. She's the daughter of Eliam. Who's this guy? Well, you got to be a little bit of a Bible detective to figure this out. Fast forward in 2 Samuel to chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23. 2 Samuel 23 is going to list out basically David's special forces, his Navy SEALs, right? His Delta Force. 2 Samuel 23, verse 34. It's listing out. Eliphalet, the son of Ahasbi of Makkah, was one of his mighty men. And so is Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite. So who is Bathsheba? She's the daughter of Eliam. Who's Eliam? He's the son of Ahithophel. You see it now? Right? You're beginning to piece it together. Who is Ahithophel? He's Bathsheba's grandfather. And he is watched as a powerful king who is universally loved. And everyone sings his praises. He's watched as he's murdered his grandson-in-law. Uriah the Hittite. He's watched as he's assaulted his granddaughter. He's watched as David has essentially caused the death of his great-grandchild. And he's basically seen no real consequences to that. No accountability. David continues to be immensely popular. So what, what is it that caused Ahithophel to change and throw his lot in with Absalom? Listen, guys, what's wrong with him? He is bitter. He is bitter at David. He hates him for what he did. There is 10 years, 10 years in between the time that, that David went into Bathsheba and the time of Absalom's rebellion. So for 10 years, he's just been stewing in this, nursing this, replaying the tapes in his head over and over and over again, letting the anger and the bitterness just boil and fester in there pretending to be loyal, pretending to bide his time, but plotting and just waiting for the moment that he could get back at him. And so Absalom begins his rebellion, and Ahithophel goes, this is it. This is how I'm going to get him. And he turns on David, and he says, let me hunt him down. Let me find him in the dark. Let me drive away all his friends, and let me kill him out there with nothing because he's bitter. You say, what does that have to do with us today? Guys, we are an increasingly bitter people. I'm just not talking about people like out there. It's a sickness that infects virtually everyone. It, men and women, right? Christians and non-Christians, Republicans, Democrat, old, young, it doesn't matter. I mean, think about all the stuff that's just going on out there. Think about, think about the relationships, right, between, between black and white people right now. There's bitterness and anger on both sides of this. 
black and brown, frustrated by a long history in America of, of slavery and segregation and redlining and what they feel is a lack of awareness in their white brothers and sisters. And, and on the other side, you get, you get white people that are frustrated and angry with this new kind of racism philosophy that just takes everybody and lumps them all in the same boat and slaps a racist sign on. And there is bitterness growing over this. Think about the vi this virus we've been dealing with for 15 months. People on one side are, are bitter and angry over rules and regulations and lockdowns and masks and what they see as heavy-handed responses from the state and local governments and freedoms curtailed and businesses ruined and schools shut down. They, people are angry. And people on the other side, bitter and angry over lack of concern over spreading the virus and public health and protecting the vomit, there is bitterness just, ah. But guys, this is not just big ticket national stuff, it's personal stuff. Somebody said something to you. Somebody did something to you. Maybe it was a boss. Maybe it was a spouse. Maybe it was a friend or child. They hurt you, and you can't seem to let it go. And you're nursing it, and you're getting more and more bitter. Maybe it was something small. Maybe it was something big, like a hit the fell. But you're not dealing with it well, and it's spawning anger and rage or bitterness. I was reading an article Friday from a Canadian pastor. He's kind of a leadership guy, but the title of the article caught my eye. Why do we hate each other so much? Five reasons that anger is the new epidemic. It was kind of interesting that it came as, as I was prepping this sermon. But he talked about how we're isolated from one another and it's exacerbated by social media and there's dangers in anonymity and just a pure amount of negative news out in it. How it all contributes just to anger and bitterness. So my question to you today, is this you? Right? Are you Ahithophel? Right? Is it just stewing down in there? And every time you pop up your search browser and go to your, right, every time you pick up your phone and cruise through social media, is it just, you're just stoking the fire in there? Because listen, guys, bitterness is going to destroy you. It's going to destroy you. Ahithophel, he counseled Absalom to strike quickly, right, to go after David with, with everything while he's tired, while he's off balance, while he's, while he's not ready, go after him now. But Absalom didn't listen. Hushai, the guy David sent back, counseled alternatively. He said, no, 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 you need to wait, consolidate power here, and then go after him. Absalom ultimately listened to Hushai, and didn't go after David. And so what happens to Ahithophel? Look at chapter 17, verse 23. 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23. And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey and went off home to his own city. He set his house in order and hanged himself. And he died was buried in the tomb with his father. He knew, knew at that point, Absalom's going to fail, David's going to come, he's going to find me, he's going to execute me. So he just goes home, gets everything in order, kills himself. The bitterness in his life destroyed him. So what are you going to do about it? if you're dealing with it. I wanna give you very quickly here as, as we kind of wrap up four things to kind of think about. Step one, right? What do you do about bitterness? Number one, you gotta, guys, you gotta identify it. Right? You've got to recognize that it's in there and it's down there. How do you do that? I wanna give you a test to take, okay? It's a very simple test. Do you see the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Right, Galatians 5.22 in the New Testament says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit, right, the fruit of the Spirit is what grows from mature, spiritually healthy, well-nourished Christian lives. Mature Christians, right, healthy Christians, guys, they love. Friends and enemies. 
Mature Christians are full of joy even in difficult times because it's not tied to your circumstances. It's tied to your relationship with God. Mature Christians are patient with themselves and with others, even others that irritate them and frustrate them and don't think like them. Mature Christians are kind in what they say and what they think and what they do. Mature Christians are, are healthy. They, like These fruits, you see them in different aspects of life, whether it's your personal life or work or public life or church or family or whatever it is. Hebrews 12, 15, though, you don't have to turn there, describes bitterness as a root. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Listen, bitterness, I, I love the way it describes that, right? But it hides beneath the surface. That's what a root is. It's down there below the surface of the ground, and you may not even know it's there. But the only way you see it is it either starts popping up or stuff up here starts to get sick and die. So think about it like this. You got a garden, you're growing your garden this summer, right? You got squash, you got tomatoes, you got corn. But underneath that garden, if there are roots of weeds, they will start drinking up and soaking up the nutrients of that soil so that those plants can't bear fruit or just die. Right? You may go look at your garden and you're like, ah, it looks fine. There's, there's no sign of disease on the plants. There's no bugs. There's, there's no anything like that. But this is, it's not thriving. What's wrong here? There may be something underneath the soil. Bitterness is something that hangs out underneath the soil. You don't often see it. But it consumes your energy. It burns it up in anger frustration. It consumes your thought. It returns them to the hurt over and over and over again. You relive it. You rehearse it. There's no peace, right? You can't get it out of your head. You can't turn it off. There's no joy because you're always angry and you're frustrated and you're short-tempered. There's no kindness. You're grouchy. There's no self-control. Eventually, things kind of go along and they get to the point where you start saying and doing things that you wouldn't otherwise do but it's because you're nursing this stuff in there. The root will eventually destroy the fruit. So if you see rotting fruit or no fruit or small, scrawny, sick fruit of the Spirit, maybe there's a root of bitterness underneath that. You got to identify what it is. And then step two, you got to confess it. Bitter and anger is a sin. Bitterness and anger, sin. All right, Greg read it this morning. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you, right? Paul says, put it away, right? It doesn't have any place in your life. Bring it to Jesus who is faithful to forgive, right? But, guys, listen, anger, but not all anger, anger like this, though. Anger and bitterness, they are sins that create that debt that we cannot pay. But Jesus, the Redeemer, came to pay for that sin. If we bring it to him and lay it down at his feet and confess it, he is faithful to forgive it. But you gotta confess it and label it for what it is. And dig it up out of the soil of your heart and lay it down at the feet of Jesus. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Then you've got to work on a tender heart. Paul says, put all this stuff away, but you can't just take that and you just, like, what's going to take its place? Be tender hearted, be kind to one another, forgiving one another. Put all that stuff away, but in its place, cultivate. Kindness and tender hardness and forgiveness. Kindness is right. You're doing what's best for others, not yourself. Tender heartedness is compassion towards them. You're looking for the good. You're seeking to understand and know and see things from their perspective. Paul is saying, strive to keep your heart soft towards one another and want what's the best for one another. And the key to this is forgiveness. Forgiving, it's not always going to go right. You're not always going to get it right. Sometimes you're, you're going to fail. But Paul says you remain kind and tenderhearted by constantly forgiving others. 
How often? Seven times? No. 70 times, seven times, right? The Lord's Prayer says, forgive us our debts as we've forgiven. Forgiveness, guys, is a choice not to keep replaying those tapes, not to keep feeding that stuff. It's hard. And only the Holy Spirit working in your heart can help you do it. But we ask him, help me keep a tender heart towards others. Even those that have hurt me. Even those that anger me or frustrate me. Identify it. Confess it. Work on keeping a tender heart. And last but certainly not least, step four. Remember who's in charge. Your father is in charge. Listen, guys, your father is writing a story that is the most amazing story in the universe, of which you are one of many characters. Right? A story which is, is, is ultimately going to culminate in a new heavens and a new earth. And he is weaving this story, and, and you're one small piece of that storyline, one thread in the tapestry, right, of history that, that, that God is weaving. We don't see the whole picture. We don't understand what's going on. We see our little piece. We see it imperfectly. But your father is in complete charge. Nothing happens except through him and by his will. And he is working in this world through Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, right? Who is powerfully directing all things for his own good and his own glory. And he is working through his spirit who is convicting us of sin and comforting us and guiding us. And there is no reason to be bitter. Our father is in charge, and he's working for our good. And ah, we may not see it. We may not understand it. We may not understand it this side of heaven, but that's okay. Your father is in charge. There's no reason to be bitter. It reminded me, uh, and I'll close with this, the old Christian hymn, It Is My Father's World. You guys remember that? This is my father's world. And to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees and skies and seas. His hand, the wonders wrought. This is my father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In rustling grass, I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king, let heavens ring. God reigns. Let the earth be glad. I'm going to pray for us. Lord God, don't let us be bitter people. Father, don't let us harbor the anger and the malice and the rage and the frustration that we see and, and happen so easily to us. God, help us to be tender-hearted. It's so hard, God. We see the, the things that are happening around us. We see the things that are happening to us. And it's such a natural reaction for us, God, just to, to clamp down on it and to just keep reliving it over and over and just let it harden our hearts like a rock. God, keep us tenderhearted, kind, forgiving one another. Help us remember that no matter what happens, that you are leading us, and that you are ultimately working for our good. We don't know how sometimes. We can't see it. But Lord, this story that you're writing, this tapestry that you're weaving, is going to be amazing when we can see the whole thing. Father, be with us. Forgive us. 
Help us to confess it. Guide us, lead us to follow your son Jesus and to look more and more like him. Though, though he was beaten and scorned and rejected, didn't let that bitterness take root in his heart. Though he was whipped and, and crucified, he said from the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Give us hearts like that. That we can look more like him. Pray this in his wonderful, matchless, glorious name through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Amen. God bless you guys. God keep you guys. God make his face to shine upon you. God bathe you in his presence and give you that peace that drives out the bitterness. God bless you. We'll see you next time.